Hello, good morning, friends. Good to see you in such large numbers today and that too on Sunday, Sunday morning. I welcome you all. Let me give a brief introduction about myself. I am Dr. Anupam Agarwal, editor and publisher of GP Clinics. Many of you must be knowing GP Clinics, but not me. So formally I'm announcing, I'm uh, introducing myself with my face. So hi to you all. So GP Clinics is a CME journal for family physicians being published every month for the last 12 years. It is with tremendous love and support you have shown towards GP Clinics all these years that we have taken this educational initiative to the next level by starting this seminar series to empower your practice. And this will be done through our own digital platform, doclive.com. So once again, I welcome you all to this unique webinar series. Now, let me give a brief about the format of the program and what makes it different. Each webinar in the series will have a case-based discussion to approach common symptoms to enable you to make an OPD or a bedside diagnosis. Secondly, we have tried to make it interactive. That is, you will be asked questions after each case and you may answer them through the keypads of your mobile and desktops. It is basically to keep you involved in the learning process instead of just being a monologue. And each subsequent session will have a new symptom for discussion. More importantly, each session summary with answers to all relevant asked in the chat box by you all would be published in the next issue of GP Clinics for your later reference. Many of you may, may have missed it. Many of you would like to revisit it again. So for that, a session summary with answers will be published, all the answers, because we may not be able to take all the questions at the end of the session. So, and I'm seeing there are many questions being asked. So all the relevant questions will be answered in the GP Clinics in the next issue along with the session summary. And importantly, certificate of participation would be given at the end of series. So when you complete all the 12 webinars or to say all the 12 symptoms, in each webinar we'll be covering one symptom. We hope this interaction will make life trusting to help empower your practice. Now the most important part of this webinar is the speaker. Who would be the speaker? Speaker for the entire series would be, that is all 12 webinars would be none other than Dr. Y.K. Ambik, who needs no introduction and I'm sure most of you are almost all of you from Maharashtra know him pretty well. And for others, I must tell you, Dr. Amdekar is a teacher, a guide, and an orator par excellence. He is a practicing pediatrician for the last 50 years, that is almost half a century. He is currently a visiting consultant to SRCC Hospital Mumbai. And he has been the faculty to Grant Medical College, JJ Group of Hospitals, mm -hmm. Institute of Child Health, Mumbai. And he has also been the past president of Indian Academy of Pediatrics. Lastly, one thing I must tell you about him is that education and teaching is his passion. No issue of GP clinics has gone without his article in the last 12 years. So if I start calculating almost 144 issues we have published. So this is the kind of commitment, consistency and perseverance he has towards education and teaching. In fact, whenever I go to him for any educational project, his one-liner has always been, it is for, if it is for education, for doctors, for GPs, I'm for it. Go ahead. So this is, so here we have Dr. Amdekar. He will enlighten us on today's subject, fever, a friend or a foe. Fever, as we know, is a very simple subject, but still there are many intriguing answers which we must know. So he will enlighten us today on the subject. Over to you, Dr. Amdekar, sir. Floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Anupam Agarwal, and good morning, friends. I think uh, fever is such a common problem in routine practice, and especially when it comes in a young child, you're always worried uh, whether this could turn out to be something very serious. And I think from that point of view, today's session is largely an interactive session, and before the session becomes interactive, I would just give you a brief of what is important to know about the basics of fever. Have you know that fever is a body's immune response to any tissue damage. 
generally an entry of an intruder, like an infecting organism, into the bloodstream. And how the nature brings out a symptom, which is really for warning a doctor something is happening, and please look at it carefully. I think fever rarely may be due to failure of temperature regulation system or the increased metabolism. This is just to keep in mind that not every time a fever is due to some tissue damage. But don't forget that tissue damage could be not only due to infection, but any inflammation. And that's how malignancy, rheumatological disorders, so many of them besides infection also cause fever. Now, what happens really is that when there is a damage due to any of the reasons to any tissue, there is an immune stimulation which produces chemicals called cytokines, which send a signal to hypothalamus, which is the thermostat that works through the autonomic nervous system and raises the body temperature to a desired level. What is more important is when there is the need to raise body temperature to a moderate degree, say about 102 degrees fever, all that the nature does is causes chills. What is chill? A peripheral vasoconstriction. So what happens is when periphery is vasoconstricted, the body does not lose heat and therefore retains heat. And that is the way a moderate rise of fever, a pa patient feels a bit of chill. You may not see that chill. And the patient feels that he's feeling cold. The periphery is cold because there is a vasoconstriction. But if the body senses that the temperature has to rise very high, say 105, then there is no time to retain heat. There is a need to produce heat. And the production of it is done by rigors. And whenever there is a rigor, that is a muscle contractions, the heat is suddenly raised. And therefore, all that we have learned is the rigors indicate very high fever of a sudden onset, whereas the chill indicates a moderate fever of a gradual onset. So these basics are very, very important. And we will see how we apply all this and once the trigger of a fever declines or disappears, then the body cools down, usually slowly or sometimes with or without sweating. Now, this is the basics, right? You got the basics right. Now, let's see how you apply it to my first interaction with you. I'm going to give you four probable answers to the question, and then you will have... 15 seconds to click which number you feel is the right. So the question on this interaction is, the rigors are due to which of the following? Malaria, urinary tract infection, typhoid, or none of the above? Your time starts now. Well, most of them seem to talk about malaria. Okay, some of them have said urinary tract infection. Nobody has said typhoid. And very few have said none of the above is a correct statement. Now, let me, let me go through the next slide that shows you where exactly is the uh, correct answer. Okay. Now, next slide, please. Uh, so just make a full screen and uh, next. Yeah, here is your answer. Now, the rigors indicate the need felt by the body to raise body temperature to a very high level, 
in a very short time. We learned that. And therefore, it may not be specific to any particular disease. Well, you are right. Malaria often does that, but not necessarily. Malaria may come even with low-grade fever. Some of you are right. UTI causes it, but not all UTI do it. And occasionally, even a typhoid comes with fever with rigor. And therefore, the correct answer is really none of the above are specific to the rigor. The point that I wanted all of us to learn is that when you get a patient with fever with rigor, it only means that body wants to raise the temperature to a very high level in a very short time. It could be due to any reason. Don't jump to say it's only malaria or a UTI, but it could be even typhoid or any type of fever. Therefore, fever with rigors or no rigors does not help a clinician to make a diagnosis. Yes, we have learned one point. Let's see now the question, is fever a friend or a foe? Now, always there is a fear when fever comes. Parents are upset, doctors are uneasy. But don't forget that whatever nature does really, whether it causes pain or whether it causes fever, it is meant to help the body to heal quickly. How does the fever do that? Whenever there is a fever, a body is heated up. There is an increase in blood supply, especially to the damaged side which brings in a lot of immune cells or antibodies which contain the damage, control the damage, and help healing process. That is how it's an indirect marker that body is doing the right thing. Imagine if somebody with a very serious bacterial infection has no fever, oh, that means we are losing this patient. So the point is, Fever, yes, is always a help to the body to heal the damage. But rarely, again, make a point, rarely fever may be harmful. And why does it occur? If there is a hyperthermia, which means fever far beyond 105, then might itself cause tissue damage. Fortunately, it's very, very rare. I'm sure I may have seen about just handful of such hyperthermic patients in my 55 years of practice. So in short, consider fever is always a friend, but to a limit, and that limit generally holds good for all practical purposes. Now I want you to introduce this concept that if fever is friend, do you want to suppress it? Give a thought. Should fever be suppressed if fever is more than 100, more than 102, or any degree of fever, or none of the above statements are right? Give a thought now, and let's start this interaction now, and time starts now for you. Very good. Most of you feel that 102 and above should be taken care of, but a good sizable number of people have said that none of the above seems to be the right answer. Okay. How interesting it is that none of you have said any degree of fever should be suppressed. I'm so happy that if somebody has only 99 or something, you don't have to rush to do anything at all. And I think, let me take you now to the uh, relevant points that I want you to kind of learn out of this interaction. Okay, now let's see how, how we go about that. And uh, we will see how, how to get on to that. Now, this was our interaction. And we want to see that you should use 
any paracetamol or antipyretic to suppress fever only if the baby is uncomfortable, the patient is uncomfortable. So take a note, fever is a friend. So why are you suppressing the friend from healing you? But if there is a discomfort, which is caused by fever, then you should address it to discomfort, not fever. What I mean is, if somebody has 101 fever, it may not be too high, but he has a very severe body ache, headache, he's irritable, he's not happy. So irrespective of that fever, you must give him paracetamol to bring down that discomfort and not just the fever. Now, how do you know discomfort? See, the best way to suggest the discomfort is if the disturbed behavior is intolerable. If somebody is extremely irritable, cranky, whatever the degree of fever, you consider an antipyretic. But if somebody has 103 fever and he's reasonably manageable, he's just lying down, but he's not lethargic. He is not irritable, though he is not having a, a happy situation. He has got a mild body ache, headache, but he is tolerating it. That's why, please make a note, intolerable disturbed behavior. That's the indication of giving some antipyretic. And the level of discomfort varies with individuals. It's not related to degree of fever. And therefore, tell the parents to use antipyretic to suppress the discomfort. Make a note here, one more thing is that discomfort related to the child or the patient and not to the mother. The mother is always uncomfortable. But the children often are not uncomfortable in spite of a reasonable moderate or high fever. And I think that is what is important. Okay, so we have learned second thing that it's not just the degree of fever, but it is the degree of discomfort that is required for using a paracetamol. My next issue for us to learn is, everyone is worried whether this fever could turn into something very serious. And that's why you sometimes take a very hurried action, which may not be often necessary. How do you pick up a seriousness of any Patient with fever, the most important is a change in behavior. If the patient is unduly irritable, unduly restless, unduly lethargic, or he has an irrelevant behavior, for example, he's talking irrelevantly, he looks to be in a confused state. I recall a child who had only 100 degree of fever, but he was looking around for his mother when the mother was standing next to him. This is a confused state. And what does all this change in behavior mean? That the brain is not functioning totally normally. This is a seriousness. Why it is not functioning normally is the next question. It could be because he is not getting enough oxygen. It could be he doesn't have enough hydration or perfusion. It could be that he has some electrolyte or acid-based disturbance. That is a part. What you and me should do is how to pick up an early seriousness. And behavior is the most important. Undue behavior. Who is not irritable? Okay. When the patient has high fever, even the doctor is irritable sometimes because the patient keeps on asking several questions. Undue irritability, lethargy, irrelevant behavior. This is very important. Urine output sometimes gives you a warning that this child has had very poor intake and therefore could be oliguric because of dehydration. And that suggests that it could be something that has really made him not even take enough fluids. What is more important on examination is if there is a disproportionate tachycardia or tachypnea. <laughs> All of us know that with one degree of rise of body temperature, the heart rate goes up by 10 number and the respiratory rate by about 2 or 3. If the fever is only 100 degrees, that is 
only about 1.5 degrees more. But the tachycardia is gone up by 30 or 40. You know that there is something serious. Same thing about the tachypnea. How important it is. Spend a little more time on looking at the pulse rate, counting the pulse rate and counting the respiratory rate. If there is a disproportionate increase in pulse rate or respiratory rate, <coughs> be sure that this child or this patient has something impending seriousness. Lastly, if there is a skin rash, worry about it. And especially the type of skin rash, hemorrhagic, for example, a purpuric spot, gangrenous spot, or a bullous hemorrhagic skin rash are always of some serious consequence. And don't forget, diphtheria is not common now, but still seen. <coughs> so look at the tonsils, look at the tonsillar membrane, and I think that takes care of it. I bet that if you keep this in mind, you will never miss seriousness. In fact, you will pick up early seriousness. Okay, take a note of this. <coughs> now, suppose once you know that there is no seriousness at all, and you have to evaluate now what's the type of fever. Look at these few things. First is degree of fever at the onset. <coughs> And the onset means first 24 hours. Has it been low? Has it been high? What is the behavior during interfebrile period? Moment you give paracetamol or whatever antipyretic, and the fever comes down even by a degree or two. If the patient looks a little better in terms of behavior, be sure that you can wait. There is nothing serious. By day or three or four, <clears throat> if the patient is getting better, you know it's something that nature is taking care. If the patient is same, there is neither worsening nor improving, then possibly you have to wait further to see where is the progress. And of course, if the patient is getting worse, then you know that you're missing something. Always look at the accompanying symptoms if any, which gives you an idea where is the localization, like cold cough, vomiting, diarrhea, whatever. You know all that. Yeah. And I think very, very important two things. One, observe the periphery, whether it's cold or hot. And observe the behavior after paracetamol. Make a note of this slide. And exactly follow what I've said. And now... Let's put all this to actual case scenarios so that we learn how to apply these basic principles to actual case scenarios. Let's have a next interaction. Okay. I've said that you must look at the periphery. And periphery during high fever. So when you see a patient at the peak of his fever, you want to know how is periphery as compared to the central part of the body. That means you touch the legs, touch the hands, and touch the abdomen or chest. And that is what I am referring to, periphery. So now the question is, if periphery during high fever, could it be cold in every disease? Or could it be hot in every disease? Or could it be hot in only central fever? Or could it be hot in malaria? Friends, time starts now for you. Very good. I can see now that delegates are now thinking rightly and trying to apply whatever we have discussed so far. Majority of you have said hot in central fever. So good. I, I think what is more important therefore is that even touching the periphery and the center and looking at exactly what is happening 
in terms of the situation i think gives you a lot of idea about how to go about all these things and i to that pattern i want you to understand that if temperature regulation system is working well then high fever should have a peripheral vasoconstriction if there is a moderate or high fever periphery has to be cold but if the periphery is hot it means only two things that the temperature regulating system is not working well which means the brain the hypothalamus is not doing its job correctly or it could be a heat fever like in a very bad summer with 45 degrees some parts of india would see heat fever where the system fails to react how good clue it is and i think what is more important there for is you may easily miss a central fever central fever is due to a brain problem the hypothalamus is not working well or heat fever and you may search for a cause for this fever but only if you touch the periphery and periphery is hot you know the point and i think this is important to touch the feet and touch the abdominal chest and make a habit you will meet all this not commonly but the day you meet one of these condition you would be thrilled to know that oh you have picked up early a totally different cause of fever and i think it will give you a, a happiness and a kick of practicing <coughs> i think uh, learn that let me get you another thing to go by i think i have already told you the fever pattern how you kind of analyze i want your opinion on can you suspect the cause of fever very early in the course of disease day 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 or 6 or it just not possible your time starts now <coughs> very good i think majority of you have said by day 3 and 4 you should be able to really pick up uh, the probable cause of fever and i think what what you have really meant by that is that in the first one or two days it is likely that you may not be able to pick up easily that kind of a cause of fever but analysis of detailed history can help suspect the probable cause and i'll tell you how to do about i think this is very very important message from me because all of you will see fever on day 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 so early in the course of illness and it's always your dilemma whether you are missing a bacterial infection whether you should give an antibiotic and i think remember that if the fever starts as a high fever in the first day it could be either of these it could be bacterial viral infection malaria or many others also okay but most important is if serious is ruled out seriousness is ruled out then it is safe to wait for first two three days of fever to decide the need of antibiotic and i'll give you a clue if the child of fever of day 2 you are not sure but he has a cold cough okay and another family member is also suffering it's very likely a viral infection and what is the peculiarity of viral infection when the fever comes down a little after your antipyretic the patient looks better for a uh, some time till the fever goes up again as against in a bacterial infection 
even if the fever comes down by a degree or two after antipyretic, the patient continues to look sick. This is very, very important to assess the behavior of a patient during interfebrile period. So watch the child. <laughs> I recall the older physician used to give paracetamol and ask the patients to wait for 15 minutes or half an hour in their dispensary. Possibly they knew that if the fever came down a little and the patient looks a little brighter, they were nearly sure there was no bacterial infection. How good is this clue? Well, please remember in medicine, nothing is 100% right. But we are trying to be 90, 95% right. So always look at interfebrile period. If interfebrile period is sick, likely you have a bacterial infection. If it is not sick, you are mostly not likely to face a bacterial infection. This is general statement. Okay. Now, if it is not a bacterial infection, it could be viral, which is going to get better in the next one or two days. It could be malaria, which will show you gradually how it's an erratic fever. Sometimes comes, sometimes doesn't come. Or it could be rheumatological or malignancy. The diagnosis can wait for another two, three days because nobody can diagnose malignancy on day one or two of fever or day three or four of fever. So what we are learning is, initially when the child comes with fever, you want to decide whether the child has a given story about that. Okay. And I think that is where the whole story goes up. So this is where I think we ended up on that. And I'm sorry we are going a little back and forth because uh, this is the first time we are doing such interactive session and I'm sure you will, we will really improve on all this. So please bear with us on that. Now, having given this idea, let me repeat what we have learned. We have learned rigors and chills are of no great help to patients. We have learned that if you have a high fever, it doesn't mean it's something serious, but seriousness is found out by change of behavior, urine output, disproportionate tachycardia and tachypnea, and possibly a skin rash or a tonsillar membrane. And now a pattern of fever, interfebrile period is an important point. And how is the progress on day three, day four, will always decide what is it. Now, print, let's apply all this knowledge to uh, actual case scenarios. I have picked up these cases the way possibly you all are likely to be seeing in your day-to-day -day practice. And I'm sure that there are many other causes of fever we are not bothered because these few cases, to my mind, represent 95% of our routine practice. So master that. Forget the 5%. Of which the best of the experts and experienced people also cannot diagnose. So we will not worry about that. Let's look at my first case. This child has fever for two days. Make a point. Fever only for two days. It was very high at onset. Okay. There was a good response to paracetamol. Child looked very normal in between fever. The fever used to come every four or six hours. As soon as the effect of paracetamol wears down, the fever comes up again. And by second day, the child started developing cold and cough. Now, friends, what is your diagnosis? We have four options, bacterial infection, viral infection, malaria, or anything else. Your time starts now. Well, none of you waited even for full 15 seconds. Okay. You knew it almost that it is mostly a viral infection. Okay. Why did you call it a viral infection? Okay. One, because it started as a high fever. The second is that 
it suddenly uh, responded to paracetamol and then when it responded to paracetamol you found that interfebrile period was quite normal and if that was so fever was rhythmic which means as soon as the effect of paracetamol goes away within 4 6 hours the fever comes up again so you have three characteristics high fever at the onset normal interfebrile period rhythmic fever every 4 6 hours <clears throat> and a cold and cough coming up to localize the infection and therefore this is typically a viral infection i am very happy that majority of you called it viral but few people called it something else i won't blame them because medicine is always not like mathematics that you are always right but more you practice this kind of an analysis more convincingly you will be getting more and more confident that yes, you know. And how will you counsel the parents? You will tell them, look, I'm sure mostly your child is going to be all right in the next two, three days. I don't want to give you any medicine. Just take antipyretic. And second, always add to say, but always remember, if there is any new symptom coming up, please let me know. I must accept that rarely I may be wrong, but keep in mind, and I'm almost sure I'm right. This is the way to counsel. Never tell anybody you are always right. Tell them you are mostly right, you have given a good thought, and you are sure the life of the patient is not in danger. But rarely you may also be wrong, and how to pick up that wrong? So if there is something new happening, please come back to me again. Or if at the end of four days, fever does not abate, then come back to me again. They will almost be sure 99% they will be all right. I think this gives parents and patients a confidence in the doctor. What is more important is, see, the patient get better because they have a faith in you and me. Well, our knowledge, our treatment, all works. But what works mostly is the faith in the doctor. And how do you get that faith from the patient? If the doctor is confident, but don't be overconfident, always make a small plea that I'm almost right, but keep in mind, anybody can be wrong. And if this happens, come back to me again, right? Let's look at the, my second case. Now this child, fever for three days. Now we are going on day three of fever. Make a note of this small thing. <clears throat> High fever at onset, did not respond well to paracetamol. He remained sick during interfebrile period. The fever came down by a degree or two, went up again every four, six hours. It was rhythmic. And by day three, he was looking even worse than before. There was no accompanying symptom, no cold cough, nothing. French. What is this diagnosis for you? Is it bacterial, viral, malaria, or anything else? Your time starts now. Wonderful. See how confident you are all becoming. I am so extremely happy. Okay, that the simple formulas that we are trying to kind of get into, and it seems to be working almost well all the time, that you got the first question right, you got the second question right. Yes, it was a typical uh, bacterial infection we are talking about, and you could see that how the things uh, can evolve easily about all these things. So, possibly, um, you have been always right on those two cases. How did you pick up bacterial infection? Even on day three, there were no symptoms, no localization. Now, just one more additional information here for you is that on day three, you have picked up that this is going to be a bacterial infection. You might have picked up even on day two. But by day three, you are sure. The question is, where is this bacterial infection? 
you will have to give a thought to that. Is it going to be a pneumonia? Is it going to be meningitis? Is it going to be typhoid? Is it going to be tonsillitis? Okay, few common conditions. If it's tonsillitis, you would have checked up his throat and started finding that there was a congested tonsil, etc. How do you pick up early pneumonia by this suspicion that on day three you have a bacterial infection? You look carefully for a respiratory rate. This patient has high fever. He's lying quietly and he could be breathing a little faster than normal. If you picked up on day two or day three that this is going to be a bacterial infection and if you very closely look at a little fast respiratory rate, not a respiratory distress, not a great tachypnea, but you watched carefully, counted carefully the respiratory rate for a minute and you found that he was lying down quietly. He's an adult, but he was breathing at about 25 times a minute. You have almost sure he is developing a pneumonia. And friends, you could have picked up pneumonia even before an X-ray showed pneumonia. Wow. Look at the power of a clinical bedside medicine. Okay. If, if you had done an X-ray chest at that time on a patient who has a mildly tachypneic, and told the parent, I'm a little worried, you have no cough, but let me have one x-ray done. And an x-ray report comes, a small suspicion of a haziness. You have shown your clinical skills. Is it so difficult? No. But I am trying to instigate you to think. And when I instigated you to think and gave you four options, you are coming out so beautifully right that I am convinced that all of us can be mostly right most of the time, only if you think. And most of us have forgotten to think. And I think that is what the whole idea of such interactive session is, right? I'm so happy we are going very well. Let's look at the third case now. Now you have a fever for four days. <clears throat> I'm pushing up a little higher now from second, third, fourth day now. Fever was high at onset. Fair response. Okay. Normal interfebrile period. Okay. He was quite all right. He had a fever coming every 12 hours. Make a note. Every antipyretic can only work for about four or six hours, rarely eight hours. At the end of which, if the disease is not controlled, fever will go up again. But this child is keeping a febrile for 12 hours. What does that tell you? That this is a natural course of the disease. The disease seems to come with twice a 24-hour fever. <clears throat> what does it tell you? It's unlikely an infection. And how is he on day four? He is not changed at all. He is neither worse nor improved. Had it been a bacterial infection, he would have got sick. He would not have kept a febrile for 12 hours. If he had a viral infection, he would have been better mostly by then. This is the way you pick up something. And now my question to you is, you have already got the answer that it must be others. Okay. But I want you to give a thought. Why not malaria as well? So let's look at this. Friends, your time starts now. Look at what you think about it. Good. <clears throat> Majority of you already know that it cannot be a bacterial or a viral infection. Okay, now that is more important. Now the question is, could it be malaria? Could it be anything else? What anything else we are not really worried about because we are not here to discuss something beyond usual. Okay, what is the characteristic of malaria? The malaria is almost always not rhythmic. That means sometimes fever comes within two days, two hours, Sometimes doesn't come for 24 hours. So irregular rhythm. 
is almost a rule of malaria. Okay. But today the malarial parasites are also become clever. They also keep on fooling us. And therefore, largely, if we go by what is the most common way of presentation, then malaria is an irregular rhythm fever. There is no rhythm. The parents will say, sometimes the fever came in three, four hours in spite of giving paracetamol, and sometimes for a good 12 hours, there is no fever at all. So rhythmic fever considers probably there is neither malaria, nor viral, nor bacterial infection, and something else. What something else? Largely of two groups, one the rheumatological disorders and another the malignancy disorders. Okay, we'll not go into all those details because that will take time for us to really pick up what it is. Let's see the fourth case. <clears throat> now this is another child with day four of fever. Initially the fever was moderate. Okay. But later, from day three, it started becoming high. Make a note. The first three patients had same kind of high fever to begin with, and the same continued, though at irregular intervals. This child is worsening on day three, but was not so bad on the first two days. Make a note of that. Now, he's sick during interfebrile period. He has got a rhythmic fever. Every four, six hours, the effect of paracetamol dies out, he gets fever again. Take a note of this. Started not as a very high fever, but became high. After three, four days, became sick. Interfebrile period is bad. Fever is rhythmic. Okay, now again, your time starts now. Which one of these four would you consider? <laughs> Very good. All of you have said it is not a viral infection nor malaria mostly. And therefore you are debating between is it a bacterial infection or is it something else which is totally a non-infective disorder? Okay, good, good thought. Now, what have we really learned so far every time? Every time what we said was that if interfebrile period is not normal, okay, then almost always it's a bacterial infection. Whereas in most of the other conditions, the patient is a little better after paracetamol. Well, there are exceptions, you are right. Therefore, those who said others are not terribly wrong. <clears throat> For example, if this patient has leukemia, a malignancy, and is running high fever, he has severe bony pains, he remains irritable even when there is no bacterial infection. So you are right in thinking, could it be others also? Or could it be a bacterial infection? But make a small note here. One is that initially it started not as a very high fever, a moderate fever, but became very high after day three, day four, what is referred typically as a step ladder pattern of fever. Step ladder, the fever starts going higher and higher over three, four days. Step ladder pattern of fever suggests that this must have started as a bacteremia. That means infection went into the bloodstream first and then decided to settle somewhere. The commonest cause of a step ladder pattern fever is a typhoid fever. So between others and bacterial infection, two points are to be highlighted. One, a sick child during interfebrile period, though a child of leukemia could be sick because of severe bony pain, so you are right. But the other is a step ladder pattern. As medicine can be very complex, you may be right in considering either of the two. And I'm so happy that the general response was equally divided between the first and the last. 
and I'm very happy about that thought process. Step ladder might go in favor of typhoid-like fever, but you will have to consider that non-infective fevers are not ruled out in this side. And here is the point where you might do a CBC, etc. We'll end up our session by talking a little about CBC as well. So you saw so far a viral infection, a typical bacterial infection where I told you how to uh, pick up early pneumonia or early meningitis by child being irritable, suggestive of headache. And we saw also non-infective fever, maybe rheumatological, because coming every 12 hours. And now we saw what looked like a typhoid fever. Let's look at this child. This is a fever for three days. High at onset, variable response. The parent said, sometimes I give antipyretic, fever doesn't come down at all. And sometimes without paracetamol also, the fever gets better. <clears> this <throat> normal interfebrile period. Rhythm is irregular. <clears throat> I'm sure you all got the answer right. Let me see how many of you got right. Your time begins now. Good. We are we are reasonably divided. However, even when we are reasonably divided, the majority felt that it must have been malaria itself. I think what is what is more important for us to learn here is that the uh, irregularity of fever. Okay, this fever was pretty irregular. Okay, I made a mention that this child had. Uh, let me get back again. Yeah, now here <clears throat> the rhythm was irregular. That's an important point to make a note. Second is a variable response. Sometimes responded, sometimes did not respond. And even at the end of day three, there was no change at all. There were no other symptoms. So very likely this is a malarial fever. Again, what I'm trying to give you an idea is that you may be 90, 95% right. You will add further on physical examination if need be by doing a CBC, yes. But if you can be almost right 90, 95% of the time only by taking a good history. I think that's the message I want you to pass on. That spend a little more time to get all these details uh, so that you are almost sure where you are dealing with. Let me give you this story now. This child started on day three, high fever at onset, good response, normal interfebrile period. Okay, rhythmic fever. Okay, make a note. Good interfebrile period, every four, six hours period. By day four, there was no fever, but the child looked lethargic. She, he's improved as far as fever is concerned, but he has become lethargic. Now, which one of these four are you talking about? And before you vote, please make a note that whatever is the probable cause of this child's fever, why did the fever disappear but child became lethargic? That means something is happening. What could precede that something that is happening? I think that is what I want you to kind of give a thought. And now your time begins now. Very good. Again, I am happy how all of you are thinking, all of you thought that this looks to be 
something that may not be very serious, but something is happening. Because if fever has gone down, then why has the child becoming suddenly uh, lethargic? What does that mean? Let's see what kind of fever this likely to be. Okay. Now look at this. Good response to paracetamol, normal interfebral period. Rhythmic fever. And no fever by day four. If I did not have lethargy there, all of you would have said it's a viral infection. That's what all of you said. But some of you said there is something other than that happening. Okay. Now, what others? I talked to you about two groups of others, rheumatological or malignancy. But none of them who start with fever come back without fever on day four. So, my point to make on this child is that this is a viral infection, but now has started getting into complication. And what does lethargy mean? Change of behavior. And we say change of behavior means a brain is involved. If brain is involved, commonly brain is involved due to two reasons, hypoperfusion or lack of oxygen. This child is not breathless. So likely he has no hypoxia. He has no oxygen problem. So he has no pneumonia. But he could be hypoperfused. But what is hypoperfusion? Dehydration. But he has not lost any fluids from the body. He has no diarrhea. He has no sweating. He has no polyuria. This is typically what is called as a capillary leak syndrome. And this child is likely to be a dengue fever, which is getting into complication. And if you wait for another 24 hours, he will develop a shock, a dengue shock syndrome. What have we learned? When the fever disappears, but something else comes up. And what is that something else? Change of behavior. We did start our discussion by saying that change of behavior is seriousness. If change of behavior comes at any time, more so when the fever has disappeared, it is a complication of a recovering infection. This is what is happening in COVID nowadays. That fever may disappear, but you get what is known as the multi-system inflammatory syndrome. And people get into ICUs on ventilation and some of them even die. They did not die of a viral infection. They died of a complication caused by viral infection. The viral infection disappeared. A typical ding, the virus goes away. Fever disappears, but the body's immune system works abnormally and gets into complication. That is how change of behavior again is important. So I'm very happy that some of you said others, you're worried. That is neither of the first three. But this was a combination of a viral infection with a complication, which is called non-infective complication. Infection has died, but the complications are due to immune system. A little, another 10 minutes uh, before we end up this discussion, I think most of you will end up doing CBC. I want you to remember that ideal time for CBC is fever of day three, day four. Not in a hurry, because almost all conditions which start acutely in the first two days have a neutrophilic leukocytosis, even a viral infection. Even an acute asthma episode can have a neutrophilic leukocytosis. What have we learned? Neutrophilic leukocytosis is a marker of an acute insult to the body. We don't know what acute insult is. But by day three, day four, the body realizes and reacts by the proper changes in the blood cells. Till then, it is first an immediate reaction. Neutrophils. Neutrophils, to my mind, are like the ordinary policeman with a lati in the hand. 
they are the first to arrive everywhere. Whether there is a traffic accident, whether there is a theft, there is a fire, everywhere, they are the first to arrive. Doesn't tell us what the problem is. But when the fire engine comes, we know it is a fire. When uh, more police come and uh, higher officers come, we know it must be a bomb blast or something. But the constables don't tell us what the problem is. Polymorphs are like constables. They are in large numbers. Okay. This is important. So don't look at CBC on day one or two. Allow body to react to what the problem is for you to interpret correctly. Now, having said that neutrophilic leukocytosis is the first response, on day three, day four, if it continues, it's mostly a bacterial infection or an inflammatory disease. Viral infection does not continue with neutrophilic leukocytosis, but leukopenia could be a feature of an acute bacterial infection like typhoid fever. And this is because the salmonella causes toxic bone marrow suppression. The toxins coming out of salmonella typhi suppress the bone marrow and cause leukopenia even when it is an acute bacterial infection. Can you imagine? You have a neutrophilic leukocytosis, may not be a bacterial infection. And you have a leukopenia, may be typhoid or bacterial infection. How difficult it is to only go by those CBC, unless you correlate with what we have discussed so far, then you know that what is the value of that. Many times you get a non-specific response in viral infection, chronic bacterial infection, TB. When you get a non-specific response, no leukocytosis, neutrophilic, no lymphocytic, nothing, you know that you cannot interpret that at all. Lastly, this is very important statement I'm making. Please take a note. Eosinopenia, which means if eosinophils go zero, it almost means that it's an acute infection, either viral or bacterial. But in all other conditions of fever, eosinophils don't go down to zero. If eosinophils are zero in your CBC, you are dealing almost always with acute viral or acute bacterial, one of the two. And we have already seen how clinical story can differentiate the two. <clears throat> I want to make one last point on this slide that don't do ESR, CRP, etc. They are useless in the early diagnosis of fever. Don't waste time and don't get them to spend more money. They are of no use whatsoever. Well, exceptions are there. But for all our routine practice, ESR or CRP are only for prognostic parameters and not for diagnosis. So leave them alone. And therefore, that is what it is. Now, I will give you again some interaction. This child had fever for three days. And look at his WBC report. Hemoglobin is 12, 16,000 WBCs, 78% polys, lymphos 20%, eosinophil 0. Platelets are a little down. Tell me which of these four conditions you are likely to diagnose. Your time begins now. <clears throat> Good. I think all of you took a note of what I said that if eosinophils are zero, then I told you that it means almost that you have a possibly an acute bacterial or acute viral infection. Very good. Now, you have to fish out between the two what it is likely to be. Now, that is what the challenge is now. Okay. Now, look at carefully this. We are on day three. <clears throat> okay. Platelets are a little on the lower side. Okay, now low platelets is a classical story between viral and bacterial of a viral infection. Okay, what is the importance of this discussion? You gave a lot of importance to eosinophils being zero. You said it's either acute bacterial or acute viral. 
your next shift of interpretation should be platelets. And if platelets are going low, it's mostly a viral infection. Platelets are low in malaria, platelets are low in viral infection, and platelets are also low in typhoid. But there is a leukopenia in typhoid. Therefore, a combination of a lower platelet and a zero eosinophil puts us more to a possible viral infection. But I'm happy that you took a note of zero eosinophil. Look at this. Again, fever for three days. Hemoglobin fine counts almost similar, but there are banned cells and toxic granules in neutrophils. Ask your pathologist to comment on banned cells and toxic granules. Banned cells are a premature polymorphs. It tells you that even if the polymorphs are 76, the body seems to send more premature polymorphs into the system. Now tell me, friends, which of these four conditions you would opt for? Your time begins now. Fine, majority of you seem to be favoring a bacterial infection. And the point that I wanted to make on this slide particularly is that you have a toxic granules. Okay, what does that mean? Something it is coming out of a toxemia. Okay, the toxins are produced largely by viral infections. And to that extent, when you see a banned cells, which means a premature polymorphs are being thrown into circulation, even on day three, you favor this to be a bacterial infection. And a typical thing for it is a toxic granules in neutrophils. Ask your pathologist to comment on banned cells and neutrophils. And you follow closely on eosinophils and platelets. This is important, right? Uh, let's get on to the next one. And this is fever for four days. On day two, somebody did a count and you had this. Eosinophils were two, platelets were 1.8. Now the fever continued. There was no response to antibiotic. And therefore, with that, counts have gone up, platelets have gone up. Now decide which of these four conditions you are looking at. Well, we seem to be almost an equally divided house. Uh, let me give you exactly what, what I want you to kind of get to understand where we stand on this. Okay, now what was happening on this side, look carefully that you had the first count, which was slightly neutrophilic, but eosinophils were not zero. What did we say? Eosinophil zero is an acute viral or bacterial infection. So this is likely to be neither of the two. Okay. Now, two days later, but somebody gave an antibiotic because there was a polymorphonuclear leukocytosis. Now, platelets were a bit on the lower side. Eosinophils were normal which meant that this is unlikely an acute infection. And look at what happened after another two days. The counts have gone up very high. Polys have gone up further high. Platelets are also gone up high. This is typically a non-infective disorder, systemic inflammatory disorder. How does a systemic inflammatory disorder vary from acute bacterial infection? One, in acute bacterial infection, eosinophils are almost always zero. Platelets are not low. 
but in an acute inflammatory, systemic inflammatory disorders, the counts look similar to begin with, except the eosinophils are not zero. But as the time goes, and if you repeat the count, in fact, the counts are going higher, platelets are going higher, it means that you have a systemic inflammatory disorder. I just wanted you to get little more complicated issues to learn, and I'm sure that we are going to put all this into a next journal issue so that you can revise that properly. This is another four days fever. WBC is low. Eosinophils are zero. Monocytes have gone up. Lymphocytes have gone up. Platelets are low. Look at the soul syndrome. Leukopenia, lymphocytosis, eosinopenia, monocytosis, and thrombocytopenia. Five things I told you. Leukopenia, lymphocytosis, monocytosis, eosinopenia, thrombocytopenia. Now, friends, what is your diagnosis? Time starts now. Good. Majority of you thought that it was possibly a bacterial infection and uh, a viral infection. And then you started getting on to uh, consideration of what else it could really be. What I wanted to drive you on this is really that uh, you, you have an issue <clears throat> where you have to decide very carefully how does this CBC look like. Now, let me take you on to this properly. Okay. Look at the low count. Okay. Look at the low count. Lymphocytosis, monocytosis, but zero eosinophil. What is zero eosinophil? Acute viral or acute bacterial. <clears throat> now, in acute viral infection, this might fit in perfectly well, but monocytosis is a little unusual feature of a viral infection. Lymphocytosis, yes, unlikely monocytosis. But if you call it a viral infection, I may not say it's terribly wrong. But considering that there is a monocytosis on day four in a leukopenic, thrombocytopenic, eosinopenic, we might consider this to be typhoid more than viral infection. Small difference. Monocytosis is not a feature of a viral infection. It is a feature of a typhoid-like infection. And therefore, again, small little thing. Uh, let me not get on to this, and let me give you a take-home message because we have already covered, uh, I thought, more than 70 minutes. Fever pattern helps in suspecting probable cause of fever. Don't suppress fever. Use antipyretic only for discomfort. They don't prescribe antibiotic in the first two, three days of fever, except in case of high-risk situation. What are high-risk situations? Any child with less than six months? Any seriousness? We already talked about immunocompromise, HIV, Patient getting treatment for malignancy, they are all immunocompromised or severely malnourished. Accompanying symptoms are important for localization. But there are bacterial infections which do not localize quickly, like typhoid, UTI, leptospira, rickettsia, brucella, so many. So just because there is no localizing symptom, you don't rule out a bacterial infection. Confirm diagnosis if possible. Some of these are important and follow the patient for a few more days after recovery because many of them get into complication after recovery, like a dengue or a COVID. I thought I've taken 70 minutes. That's long enough. I hope, Dr. Agarwal, it was not too long. But if there are any more questions, then if time permits, we can answer those questions. I think there, is a, there are a number of questions. 
So, uh, if you permit, can we skip those questions and we take uh, cover all those questions in our next issue of GP Clinics? Will that be okay? Yeah, I think so because I will answer all the questions that are raised by all of you. Please bear with us. And in fact, I will put up a summary of what I've said. And at the end of that small summary, I will answer all questions put up by all of you, giving question and answer so that you have a good uh, text for revision with you. If that is all right, Dr. Garwal, then uh, this was our first attempt at interactive session. I hope you enjoyed that. And I enjoyed it very much because most of you got most of the answers right. And I want you to revise this principle of application of basic knowledge, which will come to you by the next issue of GP Clinic. And I think we will run every month like this. Dr. Agarwal, if that is all right, back to you to end the session. I think it is fair enough. I think we'll cover all the questions in uh, our next issue of GP Clinic, so keep watching. So now, as we are coming close to the end of today's session, on behalf of GP Clinics and DocIsLive.com platform, I thank you all the doctors who have attended this session. And it is quite overwhelming to see such a huge attendance that too on a Sunday morning. Thank you all of you once again. I hope it must have been a memorable learning session for all of you as maybe all the future ones as well. I also thank Dr. Y.K. Amdekar, sir, for sparing your valuable time for all of us. Listening to you has always been a learning feat. I'm sure everybody, everyone would agree. Please note that the date for the next webinar would be on 24th of July, 2022, Sunday, 11 a.m., same time. The topic would be cough, a distress to a patient, and challenge to a physician. One more thing, important thing I would like to mention, we are starting a WhatsApp group by the name of docislive.com for you to join this group to get regular updates about the series and future webinars and all our digital activities we plan ahead. And lastly, I request you to please give your valuable feedback for us to improve to serve you better in subsequent webinars. Thank you once again to all of you. Good day. Thank you very much, Dr. Garwal, and thank you very much, Dinesh, for a wonderful coordination. I'm sure we would improve in our next session to some extent. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you very much.